Welcome to Security Token Stories, brought to you by Security Token Academy, the leading educational platform dedicated to covering and facilitating the security token industry. I'm Derek Edward Schloss, Director of Strategy at Security Token Academy. Coming up on today's episode, we have Stephen McKeon, partner at Collaborative Fund. Collaborative is a San Francisco and New York-based venture fund investing in blockchain-based financial infrastructure with an eye towards the future of our financial markets. Steve is also a finance professor at the University of Oregon and one of my favorite thinkers in the security token space. As many of you who listen to the show know, I've had Steven on the show two other times in the past. In this episode, we dive right back into topics like crypto asset valuation, security token base layers, decentralized finance, projects like DeFi Money Market, Chainlink, MakerDAO, MetaCartel Ventures, Open Laws the Lao, and other projects that implicate security tokens and blockchain-based finance. Steve wears a number of hats across the blockchain space, and he shares a ton of great insights about how he's evaluating both the security token industry and the larger blockchain space today. One final note before we jump into the episode. In addition to reminding our listeners to carefully read the disclaimer info on our website at securitytokenacademy.com, I'd like to mention that Security Token Academy considers the information to be provided in this podcast to be of interest to our listeners, but we make no representation as to how or whether any campaigns or projects discussed on the podcast fit into any regulatory system either inside or outside the U.S. It's also important to note that the information, projects, and frameworks discussed in the podcast episode today is purely educational and not investment advice. Now, on to the episode with Stephen McKeon. Steve, welcome back to Security Token Stories. Thanks, Derek. You are the only guest to have appeared on this show three times. Um, whenever I bring you on, it's it's always fun to do a roundup of of different blockchain topics since you kind of study and write and publish work across a, a number of different themes. The stuff we've talked about in the past, um, you know, we've we've dived into to, to kind of the macro finance stuff. We've we've talked about your role venture investing with Collaborative Fund. We talk security tokens, DeFi, digitized finance. Um, I think we're going to touch on all those today. You're kind of a roundup of, of things you've been thinking about recently. And um, yeah, we'll make this a, a great, uh, a great uh, third part to the, uh, to the series. How does that sound? Sounds great. It, yeah, definitely an honor to uh, be the most common guest. Uh, I'm a regular listener. Awesome. Cool. So, Steve, we're recording this episode on a pretty special day. It's the, um, it's the 10-year anniversary of Bitcoin Pizza Day. So, 10 years ago... This was May 22nd, 2010. A man named Laszlo bought $25 worth of pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin, which would give those pizzas a value of something like $90 million at today's uh, Bitcoin price. Um, so, you know, Steve, as a finance professor who in the past has done a ton of work writing and studying our markets, uh, things and concepts like value and price and the discrepancy between these areas of finance, as well as a venture investor currently in the blockchain space. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the, on today, on Bitcoin Pizza Day, the original Bitcoin pizza purchase at the time and its role kind of kickstarting this informal price for valuing Bitcoin. And whether or not, you know, 10 years later today, our methods for valuing Bitcoin and other crypto assets has improved. Yeah, so um, first of all, I just think it's awesome that this space has a holiday around uh, <laughs> pizza. But I think to your question, um, it was really the zero to one moment, right? In a sense that it was the first commercial transaction with Bitcoin. And so in terms of price discovery, there really had never been any prior to that. So we look back and we look at today's price and it looks crazy, right? $90 million or $91 million for two pizzas. But remember that prior to this transaction, Bitcoin effectively had, had zero value. There were some estimates around cost of mining and that type of thing, but this is sort of the first documented commercial transaction. So I think that's why it's such an important day uh, for the space. So look, as we know, valuation of commodities like Bitcoin is challenging. Uh, obviously, a lot of work has been done um, since the 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizza transaction. Um, and we've got a bunch of different models now that we can use some based on other types of commodities but ultimately it's really more about price discovery than valuation in the sense that what you're really doing is forecasting supply and demand that influence the price of bitcoin because bitcoin itself is not a cash flow generating asset so that's what sets it apart from valuing uh, something like equity 
So Bitcoin Pizza Day was really important just because it was the first price discovery for the asset. Yeah, 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 super interesting. And kind of piggybacking on that, you know, since Bitcoin Pizza Day and over the last couple of years specifically, we've had a number of other crypto assets launch that kind of have some of these characteristics that are maybe a little bit easier to price. Do we feel like we have a, a better handle on it now than we did a year ago? I guess I'm, I'm curious to hear how you think about this with, with you know, the, the different lenses that you have. Yeah, so I think that, you know, part of the issue is that for outsiders, they look at the crypto ecosystem and you start talking about valuation and, and then maybe they view it as homogeneous. But as we know, for anybody who's been involved in this space for any amount of time, there's massive heterogeneity, right? So there's definitely never going to be a one valuation metric that fits all crypto assets. You know, as you and I have talked about previously, crypto assets are just a functional form, right? It's, it's a wrapper. And valuation is highly dependent on what's inside, um, not necessarily on the wrapper. And so, you know, if it's, if it's a share of equity that's inside, you value it with discount of cash flow and comps and the traditional sort of methods that we have. Um, if it's a fixed income instrument, you value it maybe a different way. If it's a decentralized network, I think those are the, the newer pieces, right? Then you really have to talk about what is the functionality of the network? Like what is the good or service that the network provisions? And the way you might look at something like Ethereum, right, which has a utility in terms of things being built on top of it, and smart contracts, and you know everything we know about that ecosystem is going to be valued differently than something like Bitcoin, which is closer to a digital commodity or digital gold. And so when you talk about valuation, it really is the main thing to focus on is what is inside the wrapper. Uh, and that's going to dictate how you think about it in terms of value. Now, one thing that is unique to crypto assets is that we can see a lot of these things on chain, right? Which is part of uh, our interest in the analytics side of the space. So, uh, you know, we have positions in Flipside and Coinmetrics, and the fact that you can view a lot of the activity on chain does create some commonality in terms of the analysis. But at the end of the day, it, it really comes down to what's inside the wrapper. I think that's great. And um, yeah, as an extension of that, let's let's jump into kind of um, kind of the the details of of some of the the stuff that we we spend a lot of time thinking about the the wrapper we um, we most talk about, which is this this digital wrapper around kind of our equity and debt and traditional securities that we um, that we kind of understand and, and have uh, valuation frameworks for. There's been a ton of movement in the security token world over this last month. Um, a few weeks ago, the Options Clearing Corporation, they announced that they were going to move $72 billion in assets to a new blockchain-based environment. Earlier this week, the DTCC, the massive post-trade settlement firm for our public markets, they announced that they have active teams exploring tokenization and settlement solutions for both private markets and public markets. Um, we also saw Overstock and T0. They issued and deployed the first security token dividend for a publicly traded company, which is now trading live on T0's registered ATS. So, Steve, um, you know, just kind of setting the stage, you know, right now, major parts of our private market and our public markets, those are still paper based and electronic. How big is the opportunity for digitization today, this digital wrapper uh, in 2020? Do you have a, a, a clear understanding or a grasp of, you know, what? the current penetration might look like in terms of, of digitization in, in traditional markets? Yeah, so I think all those news articles you pointed to are are part of the same trend, right? Which is that we're just seeing over and over, I mean, actually, many of these I, I, I first learned about through your newsletter. Um, but, you know, your newsletter, it always has lots of bullet points, right? So there's lots of news coming out every single week around these tokenized securities. But the, the penetration is still minute, right, for, for tokenized securities. I mean, um, I love what Overstock is doing, but as you said, that's the very first time that a security token dividend uh, has ever been issued by a publicly traded company. So I think probably the first of many as we move down the road here. But even if you step back from tokenized securities and you just say, what does digitization look like generally um, for assets? You know, you might look to something like Carta, right? So Carta has digitized probably about 14,000 cap tables. These are primarily venture-backed firms in the U.S. 
Um, public markets, of course, have digitized uh, a few thousand more. But the truth is that there's millions of assets out there globally. And in many cases, even if the equity is digitized, the debt may not be. And things are digitized even less frequently for asset classes like real estate. So my view is that we, even including all of these non-token form bases, uh, based methods of digitization, we barely tapped the total market. My guess is it's something like 1% of assets globally. We in the securities token industry, I think, live in this in this in this bubble where I think we see the future. Um, it's happening, but um, you know, I think oftentimes it's it's very much you know we're not we're not very loud in the in the grand scheme of things. So I'm curious to hear um, just in your experience that you know with one foot in you know the traditional asset world and one foot in um, the blockchain world. I'm curious, do you see the trends towards um, blockchain based assets, blockchain based securities accelerating? Um, how are you thinking about security token adoption like more broadly right now in May and June of 2020? Yeah, so I mean, I think if you step back, then what you realize is that, you know, for the assets that are digitized, whether that's Carta or, um, or even sort of tracking ownership on an Excel spreadsheet, um, you know, these traditional databases they don't really produce trust in the same way that blockchain ecosystems can. And the other thing is that they don't necessarily play nicely with each other, so they're not um, interoperable. And these are really important pieces because that's kind of what blockchain boils down to. So you need both of those things to solve, um, to, to sort of optimize for efficiency and fee reduction in these environments. And so I guess just taking a minute to chat about this concept of trust I think it's fascinating as an economist because, you know, economic activity simply doesn't happen without it. And that's been shown in everything from the market to used cars to regional financial market development for things like equity and debt. Uh, and so you almost have to step back and you have to ask, where does trust come from? So how is it generated? And this is sort of like the lens through which I view the whole space. So. As you know, I, I spent several months in Cambridge last year in the UK, and I was part of a center called CCAF. And the guy who is one of the directors there, Bob Wardrop and I, uh, he introduced me to this paper by a sociologist named Lynn Zucker. And it turns out that she investigated this exact question, where does trust come from? And sort of prior to 1840, trust was generated primarily through geographical proximity, like repeated transactions. Right? So people in the same community did business with, she, with each other repeatedly, and these repeated transactions were the trust-producing mechanism. And that worked pretty well for centuries, because most economic activity uh, was local, like people didn't move around that much. But then what happened in the 1800s was that there was a technology shock, which was the steam engine, and then later the combustible engine. And this had some really important effects on the economy. So Railroads, for example, went from almost non-existent to hundreds of thousands of miles of track uh, just within a few decades. And people started immigrating in droves to the New World from Europe and elsewhere on steam-powered ships because the steam engine had dropped the cost of travel massively. And so what this meant for trust production is that the methods we were using, like repeated transactions with familiar counterparties, they just didn't work anymore. Because now people could transact at distance and market participants didn't necessarily share the same culture and values and they were unknown to the counterparty. And so society needed new methods to produce trust. And the answer was institutions. And so these are things like US financial markets, the banking system, the insurance industry, you know, securities and corporate regulations. All of these things grew to prominence during this era in large part because these institutions were really good at producing trust. So trust effectively became like a saleable good and trust production became a huge business. And so it led to massive scale, right? For the banking system, for capital markets, for risk management tools. It's hard to overstate the importance of institutional trust production over the past 150 years. But the thing is the institutions have extracted substantial rents in the process, right? So these are profit generating businesses and they are sell producing and selling trust um, as the business model. Now, what's interesting is that 
just more recently, in more recent decades, so particularly the last two decades, we've seen the rise of the internet and digitization in general, as we were discussing. And this really represents another technology shock on the same order as the steam engine. And because it had similar effects, right? So it, it shifted our ability to transact at distance, right? So it, when the railroads came about, all of a sudden, a seller in New York could ship a good to a buyer in uh, Chicago, right? And, and what the internet does is it allows us to move goods and services digitally, literally around the globe instantaneously. It's also altered the mobility of labor. Right, so whereas steam engines and steam ships, all of a sudden we had people migrating from, say, Europe to the U.S. Now we can move labor around uh, digitally, right? So you could have a team that is in India or China or somewhere in Europe or South America working for uh, a, a different part of the team that's based here in the U.S. So the mobility of labor has has shifted dramatically with the advent of the internet. And what this means is that these institutional trust production mechanisms that we've been using for the last 150 years, they're just not constructed for this new paradigm. So, for example, like the banking systems of the globe are generally built within national jurisdictions, right? And so we've created some systems with correspondent banking and so on for these things to interoperate. But the truth is, like, they're just not built to interact globally. And the new contracting environment is global and automated. So this is where blockchains enter, right? Because they are effectively trust production machines that are natively global, they're digital, uh, and in many cases, they're automated with smart contracts. And so this is going to massively disrupt the business of trust production, which is a huge segment of the economy. And security tokens play right into this theme. So to get back to your original question, there's no question it's going to continue to accelerate. Um, I mean, just this week, France's central bank issued a bond issuance uh, and settled it with a digital euro. And it's hard to understate the importance of the stablecoin market and security token market for each other, right? I've been saying this for years, but it's exciting to see all the momentum around stablecoins and central bank digital currencies because to the extent that they are interoperable with the rest of the ecosystem, it's going to allow us to settle these trades on chain, uh, which is going to be a game changer. Um, so Steve, you know, we, we just talked about the theory a little bit. Like, I'd love to dive into the practical. So maybe this is taking off your professor of finance hat and putting on your, um, your VC hat uh, over at, uh, at, at Collaborative Fund. Um, something you and I talk a lot about is, is uh, when, when we talk about security tokens are base layers. So where these things are actually going to trade and permissionless and public and uh, permissioned and, um, you know, the different use cases and the unique needs that, that base layers should have um, as a result of the folks using it, the folks issuing assets on top of it. Um, you know, uh, we can we can kind of get a little bit more granular. Uh, you know, Ethereum is starting to embark on their ETH 2.0 roadmap this year with a number of security token protocols and platforms building compliance as a second layer on top of that chain. Um, you know, the Polymath team is is releasing their Polymesh blockchain using Substrate. That effort seems to uh, focus really heavily on high throughput enterprise and institutional use cases. Um, we saw a few months ago the Ravencoin developers, they launched some really interesting tooling for um, blockchain-based securities called Tags and Restricted Assets. Um, you know, we've also seen a number of other smart contract platforms, Tezos and Algorand, and folks are issuing securities on top of them. And they're, they're, those have, you know, burgeoning uh, ecosystems as well. So, um, you know, there's others. There's Onera and, and even Libra um, waiting in the wings. So, Steve, um, I guess as it relates to security token base layers, how do you think about base layers in your role at, at, at Collaborative Fund? Why are we seeing uh, these next generation base layers for, for security tokens sprout up? Um, what problems do you think they're solving um, that you know these first gen uh, base layers didn't? I guess uh, I'm curious to, to kind of pick your brain and, and hear in, in more detail how you're thinking about the activity happening here at the base layer. Yeah, so we hold positions in several base layers, um, all of which I think have some security token issuance activity, uh, obviously among other things. And it's an important part of constructing a portfolio in this space. So I think what happened is, look, uh, Ethereum jumped out to an early lead, right? Um, that was really the smart contract platform that fueled 
the 2017 ICO boom. I think it was 85 or 90 percent of of all projects that came to market came to market on Ethereum. We've recently seen the same thing in DeFi, right? So 90 percent plus of all DeFi projects are building on Ethereum, but people also recognize that there's a bunch of limitations with Ethereum. And we don't have to dive down that rabbit hole to get all uh, to go through all of those. Um, I think some of those are obviously trying to be addressed in Ethereum 2.0, but there was this opening for additional uh, smart contract platforms to come to market. And so we saw Tezos, we saw Algorand, uh, Ravencoin, and as you mentioned, we've got more that are that are coming to market yet, right? Like like Polymash and uh, Polkadot and many others. So I think what became clear is that a lot of value accrues to that layer. And so there's going to be a lot of competition for Ethereum going forward. Now, what's interesting is that even the ones that have come to market have not made a huge dent uh, in Ethereum's sort of dominant market position. Um, they, you know, Chris uh, and Joel over at um, Placeholder wrote a great article on Ethereum killers several months ago. And it's been interesting. And so what they've been doing, when you look at Tezos or Algorand, is that they're trying to find use cases where they can sort of build a brand or a, or a niche. And I think security tokens are one of those. And so Tezos in particular, you've seen a lot of activity in terms of various security token platforms that are beginning to uh, support that chain. Same thing with Algorand. Uh, and then you've got the new entrants like Polymesh, which are focusing sort of exclusively on security tokens and trying to, to sort of purpose build a chain with every sort of facet of what you might want in terms of security tokens and security token trading sort of built into the base layer. And so uh, I guess the short version is like we think about it constantly because it's going to be one of the major sources of value accrual in the space. Um, and we're taking multiple positions. And I think, you know, time will tell in terms of where security tokens land. I think a lot of this is going to be driven by the institutions, because if you look at where securities are issued today, most of them are issued by institutions. And so they're going to have a part to play in sort of determining which of these things get adopted. You know, something I always come back to, Steve, is we are dealing with open source technology here. And yeah, you know, it's 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 difficult for me to understand like where moats will be built. Um, you know, sometimes it's just like first to market. Ethereum did an amazing job in terms of um, kind of kickstarting the capital formation trend that happened with ICOs. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the stuff, the activity happening on base layers, could there are at least the technology supporting uh, security tokens I could could eventually just move to to other security tokens uh, base layers. And so I'm I'm always thinking like I guess how, how these moats will will be built to stand the test of time five ten years from now, given that you know we're really dealing. With with, with open source tech, um, I don't have a great answer. It's something that I think about, but I'm curious. Do you, do you envision a world where eventually, you know, the the properties that support security tokens become commoditized, and we have a, a multi chain world where many base layers will be used for security tokens? Is there any more nuance there that you that you think about, or you, you'd like to add? Yeah, so I do think we're we're moving towards a multi chain world. Um, it's obviously still to be determined. Uh, but different use cases have different needs in terms of of the base layer. So the thing that's going to drive a multi-chain world, though, is really that interoperability solutions continue to be developed. And so I, I think the end state is that the user, the end user, I should say, uh, will increasingly just become blockchain agnostic as time goes on. They, they won't care, right? I mean, this is how it is everywhere in tech. Like, users don't care what programming language was used to develop a piece of software. They care about the features of the software. Developers then use the language that they feel can best deliver the functionality they're trying to provide. I think the same thing will be true with, with uh, the choice of chain. They'll be optimized for different purposes, um, but increasingly to the extent they're, they're interoperable, I think it's going to be the end user interfaces are going to abstract from choice of chain. 
you know, let's talk about one of these use cases. You know, we've we've talked about it with you on the show before. Um, it's it's decentralized finance, open finance, DeFi. Um, the intersection of DeFi and security tokens is something that we've both been following for a while, and we've talked about this idea um, of trust minimized finance. Uh, your team at Collaborative Fund works closely with uh, with a lot of these projects and these protocols. Uh, others you're following very closely. I, I have a list here of a couple of projects um, that I think implicate the world of security tokens as it relates to DeFi. Um, can we just go through one by one and, and you can riff on your thoughts and, and we can kind of see where the, the com- conversation meanders? Perfect. Let's do it. Great. So there's um, there's DMM DeFi money market, and so from what I understand, I, I just came across this earlier this week. Um, DeFi money market allows any party on Ethereum to earn yield backed by a decentralized money market of real world interest genera- generating assets. Um, do you have uh, any any color on how this works? What kind of assets they're tackling first? How close they're to launching, and and how exactly they are interoperating with the rest of the DeFi ecosystem? Sure. So uh, this is an exciting project. I've been following it for a long time. I've, I've known Greg Keo, the, um, the CEO, for a long time. Uh, and they're launched, right? So you can go right now to DeFi Money Market uh, and, and connect to your uh, wallet and go ahead and interact with the ecosystem today. So it's live. Um, bringing real-world assets on chain is a huge opportunity. I think you and I share that view. But the truth is, it can be messy, right? So the thing I like about Greg is that he's been playing at the intersection of technology and fixed income for his whole career. So he knows the off-chain landscape, which is critical to executing this successfully. So take a car loan, right? Take a car loan on DMM versus like an Ether loan on Maker. Well, if the covenants of the CDP on Maker are violated, the underlying asset gets liquidated. Like there's a mechanism for that. Car loans are obviously much more complicated because they're in meat space, right? So you you need somebody like Greg that understands the market for car loans, how they get originated, how they get serviced, how they get repossessed if necessary. Like what is the infrastructure that can facilitate all those things so that you can abstract all of that away for the token investor. So I think it's going to expand, you know, and be substantially more than than car loans. I think fixed income generally is a is a huge opportunity, um, but that's where they started because that's where they have a lot of expertise off chain. And so, yeah, this is this is one that I'm watching carefully. Yeah, the off chain real world assets. I agree. It's it's um, it's very exciting. You know, the thing that I always come back to is, um, you know, one of the the core problems to bringing these real world assets or these real world kind of data feeds um, to the to the blockchain based ecosystem is um, what's you know commonly referred to as the Oracle problem. So trying to get off chain data uh, brought onto these chains in a way that's at least um, semi tamper resistant, non censorable, non modifiable is kind of the data that's stored on the blockchain itself. Um, and so I think. You know, trying to bring this this off chain data into the blockchain is a, is a uh, is a is a difficult problem to solve. Um, do you have any insight on how DMM or some of these other projects that are trying to link these two worlds together are are thinking about oracles or thinking about the oracle problem? I know there's a number of protocols on chain that that are um, are, are creating you know skin in the game crypto economic ways to kind of um, to mitigate against some of the um, the problems that could arise uh, when you when you're bringing that 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 information that data onto the chain. And I'm I'm curious to to hear if you have any color insight on, on any of those solutions? Yeah, so DMM is using Chainlink, um, as many others are. As you mentioned, it's not the only solution. And I guess I'd say more generally that I totally agree, oracles are critical components of smart contracts, and, and smart contracts are ultimately one of the most interesting features of the space. So you know, for those listeners that aren't familiar, uh, oracles are the mechanism that passes information into a smart contract that triggers execution. So when the participants in a smart contract uh, are choosing an oracle, what they're doing is they're defining what version of the truth are we going to believe, right? Like what is the information source we're going to use to trigger execution of this contract? Chainlink has jumped out to a a leading position, Um, but it's kind of like Legos, right? So, So all these efforts around security tokens are amplified by what everyone else is building. So two years ago, there was like almost no infrastructure 
uh, for, for security tokens generally. But now you have a whole suite of issuance platforms like Tokensoft and Vertalo and Syric, uh, Securitize and others. Uh, you have oracles that are maturing. You have marketplaces coming online like Open Finance and T0 and Texture and Polybird and Archex. Uh, custody is getting sorted out. All of these things bolt together like Legos, right? Like it's really tough for any of them to succeed individually, but like now as all the related infrastructure is maturing to the point where you can start bolting these things together, it's creating an ecosystem that is gaining momentum. You know, one of the the core pillars of, of open finance and DeFi um, and a project that you've worked closely with that is also thinking about some of the 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 Oracle issues that, that we just talked about is the, um, the decentralized credit facility maker DAO where users can input on chain collateral and, and in return, get these synthetic stable co- stable coins that are mapped to the U S dollar. And part of maker DAO's roadmap has been to start including other forms of collateral. They've started with other crypto assets like Brave's bat token, but they've also talked about the possibility of allowing security tokens to be used as collateral types. And so I'm curious, um, you know, having followed the project closely, um, over the last couple of years, do you think MakerDAO in the future or a decentralized credit facility like MakerDAO will eventually allow or figure out or solve these these kind of these limitations around um, oracles and smart contracts to allow these real world assets or these real world indexes to be used as um, as collateral um, and, and to, to, to get in return these um, synthetic stable coins? Absolutely. So huge fan of, of MakerDAO. It's in our portfolio. Um, you know, as you know, DAI, which is the stable coin emitted by the protocol, is is probably the most widely adopted asset in all of DeFi outside of ETH. Um, and so this multi-collateral feature is really important because it's going to, you know, allow more and more types of assets to enter the collateral pool, which is going to open up uh, the facility to to take a stable coin issuance uh, issuance when you when you post them as collateral. And so the, the things they added initially were other crypto assets, but the, the view has always been that eventually they'll be able to expand out uh, to traditional assets that are tokenized as well. I think the, the trick is going to be that Maker is really set up to work best when there is a liquid market for the underlying asset, right? So to the extent somebody created a token that replicated um, Apple stock or Apple stock was directly tokenized. So there's some tokenized version of of something where there's a, a large liquid market for the asset. That would be an easy ad, right? Because, um, I mean, setting aside any sort of like regulatory issues, there's what you need is a liquid market so that if the, if the covenants around the CDP are violated, that the asset can be immediately effectively repossessed and sold right to cure uh the underlying issuance that was that is related to that particular cdp and so anything that has that sort of a market is a candidate now where it gets a little trickier is when you're talking about things like what dmm is doing right where the underlying collateral Maybe it's because it's really heterogeneous, um, like automobiles, or maybe it's just because it's it's super thinly traded. But I think that's where there's going to need to be a lot of work done, is where the, there's some extra step that needs to get taken uh, to liquidate the asset. And maybe there's some sort of um, liquidity premium because it's it's very difficult to liquidate the asset. That's where it's going to be a little trickier. And I think those things are a little bit further down the road. And so that's why it's exciting to see Maker moving in the direction of multi-collateral, as well as projects like DMM that are kind of dealing with like the messier side of, of real-world assets on chain. Yeah, I'm so curious to see where we'll be a year from now with a lot of these projects tackling very similar problems. You said it best. It's kind of like these Legos are, are getting put together. And um, and although it just feels kind of like gamey and experimenty right now, it does feel like the trajectory for this stuff is is going to be pretty impressive. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, exer- I'm excited to see how all this stuff maps out. Um, 
you know, Steve, I want to, um, we can close out with, with one of my favorite topics, and this is uh, likely going to be the topic of my next paper. Um, I want to talk about DAOs. Um, so decentralized autonomous organizations. Vitalik Buterin had this amazing essay he wrote a few years back where he walked through um, the taxonomy of different decentralized organizations, and DAOs was one of them, and he characterized DAOs as um, an organization with hard-coded automation at the center and human-powered decision-making at the edges. And we've started to see a number of really interesting DAO projects sprout up um, over the last couple of months. Meta Cartel Ventures is a DAO VC firm investing in Ethereum protocols. Open Law, uh, I, think, I think this was last month, they just launched the LAO, which is an LLC wrapped DAO. Um, and that, that's a, an adventure, a venture firm for accredited investors. Um, you and I have talked about DAOs before on the podcast somewhat briefly, but I'm curious to hear if your views have changed. Are you excited about what you're seeing, how you're thinking about them? And um, and maybe talk about the the few of the projects you're tracking in the DAO space and how you think that may converge with um, the stuff happening in the security token space. Yeah, so, um, I mean, as you know, always have been fascinated by DAOs. I think what we're seeing now is DAOs are, are growing up. Uh, we're starting to see different um, sort of evolutions of DAOs. So you mentioned the LAO, right, which is adding some kind of legal structure uh, around the DAO. We're seeing um this this new daa right so the decentralized um autonomous association which is based on on swiss law and so i think people are are starting because look the original issue with the dao back in 2016 i mean outside of it being hacked was that the sec basically came out and said this is a direct violation of of security law and so people have been you know thinking hard about how do we how do we execute this in a way um, that is either you know regulatory resistant or compliant with regulations? And so ultimately, DAOs are all about governance in the sense that you know I like the way you phrased that earlier in terms of or maybe it was really for Vitalik's words that um, it's about automation, but coupling that with the human component, right? So so decisions still have to be made. So take MakerDAO, right? We interact with that one a lot because it's in our portfolio. You know, when you think about adding a new asset to the collateral pool, like there needs, that's not an automated feature. Like there needs to be a discussion about that and pros and cons. And DAOs kind of give you a structure to be able to execute decisions on those types of things. Um, also really excited about Meta Cartel Ventures, you mentioned. Um, I think you're going to be seeing more and more DAOs, I mean, DMM ultimately is going to be organized as a DAO. We've got other things in our portfolio that are going to go uh, the DAO route. And so, uh, yeah, short version is I think you're seeing an evolution like everything else in the space. Um, I still think it's getting traction, uh, but there, there has to be, you know, governance has always been a challenge for these decentralized protocols. And so to the extent we can add a little bit of structure um, that assists in sort of good protocol governance, uh, I think that's that is definitely a beneficial thing for the space. And I've, I've been kicking around this idea for a while. I actually think I, we talked about this over coffee earlier this year, but um, you know, I, I think it's Naval who said that traditional investors like investment groups or funds who are investing, they provide three core values to startups. Um, it's money, it's advice, and it's connectivity. Uh, you know, all three of these core value adds for taking money as investment, they become a little bit more supercharged and more efficient and more democratic with things like DAOs and blockchain-based capital formation. You have more people in more geographic locations. Uh, presumably, you know, you're able to raise more money and, and get more advice and more connectivity. And with incentives at play, you, you start to see these communities get supercharged. You know, I'm, I'm curious, Steve, you know, bringing, bringing this back to, to our conversation and, and kind of your role as a VC, do you see the role of venture investing changing over the next couple of years, next 5, 10, 15 years? Are, are, are these trends that you're keeping an eye on? Um, does the role of the venture investor, um, you know, get modified as a result of the flattening of these three things, the money and the advice and connectivity being, you know, so, so easily accessible peer to peer in the future? I guess, how are you thinking about this? Yeah, so, I mean, definitely have a lot of thoughts on this topic, and I know we have limited time, so I'll, I'll try to distill it down. Um, I think that in terms of raising capital, um, at the fund level, you could see that change, right? So blockchain capital's um, BCAP token and the idea of potentially 
uh, being able to solicit investment from a much wider audience. Um, the interesting thing, and I think this is a problem that remains unsolved, and I guess this is the one place where I would push back, right, is that if, if, the, if the sources of value are advice and connectivity and all of these things, those things do require effort, right? They require effort on the person providing them. And when you look at it from the standpoint of a venture investor, they have a tremendous incentive to add value because they will take a large stake, right? So they maybe have, uh, maybe they own 10% of the company or they own 5% of the protocol or, or whatever it is, there's a lot of money at stake. And that's what their investors are paying them to do is to be professionally connected uh, and be able to provide good advice. It's like those are the attributes you look for in a venture investor. And so the one challenge you have around really distributed ownership uh, is the problem that you've got to create an incentive mechanism for people to exert that effort. And the model where everybody, you know, if you have, uh, if you take a million dollars from one venture firm, right, they're going to be really focused on you. Whereas if you take one dollar from a million people, none of those people necessarily have enough incentive if they only have one dollar at stake um, to exert the level of effort that would be required um, to add that value, right? So I think that is the really big challenge that the space faces in terms of really decentralized, dispersed ownership is that uh, incentives are definitely related to the amount that one has at stake. And so I think trying to figure out how can we, how can we get um, sort of the crowd to perform these functions of venture investors uh, would need to get sorted out before you really see the venture model heavily displaced. All right, Steve. Um, yeah, c closing up. Um, where can people find you? Where Where can people learn more about the the projects you're working with? Um, and then any final thoughts? Um, you know, as we as we close out your your third appearance on uh, Security Token Stories. Yeah. So um, you know, we're at collaborativefund.com. Uh, so the name of our portfolio is, is Collab Plus Currency and um, Right now, so you know, on Twitter individually, I'm um, SB McKeon. Uh, Collaborative Fund also has a handle. We might launch one specifically for the crypto fund uh, in the coming weeks. But I guess those are the places to interact with me. I think in the final thought, you know, just given all the craziness in the world right now, it's just a really great feeling to be involved in a space that is clearly on the ascendancy, even in this environment. And I think, you know, being kind of within Collaborative gives us a unique view on this because Collaborative is really a platform, right? So the, it's traditionally known as a seed investor. The seed fund is sort of the main fund. Um, but we've also got a growth equity fund that deals with later stage companies. We've got a public markets vehicle. We've got this crypto vehicle. And so we can kind of see the world from a lot of different angles. And I know as I go through these all hands calls and I kind of see what's going on um, you know, through all the different segments of the economy, that it just becomes clearer and clearer that crypto is sort of like the place uh, that I'm really excited to be right now. And, um, and it just really feels like it's on the ascendancy. So I, I think we're blessed to, to have the future in front of us that I, I believe we have. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And if we're talking about collaborative fund assets, you also have um, the best writer on Twitter, Morgan Housel, who just wrote a killer piece uh, this week on um, on kind of his history and and um, on uh, skiing and and some of his friends and 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 growing up and tying it back to um, some of the, the 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 market stuff that we're facing right now. So um, yeah, great team. Yeah, uh, the title of that just for you listeners was called Three Sides of Risk. Um, I highly recommend it. I think it's, you know, it's one of the best things Morgan's ever written. And, and that's a really, really high bar for those that know him. Um, and and the, the key is that it deals with tail risk, right? And tail risk is like something we think about in crypto all the time. And so um, would highly recommend that article. You can find it on collaborativefund.com and just click on blog. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today, Steve. And we'll we'll get you on for a fourth time here uh, later this year. Looking forward to it. That's it for this week's episode of Security Token Stories. For more security token content, 
visit us online at securitytokenacademy.com and subscribe to our newsletter, The Security Token Edge, which lands in your mailbox each weekend. You can also keep up with the latest security token news by following us on Twitter, Telegram, YouTube, Facebook, and Medium. Before we go, a big thank you to Security Token Academy's Platinum and Gold Corporate members who make this podcast possible. You can learn more about Security Token Academy's corporate members at securitytokenacademy.com. I'm Derek Edward Schloss. From all of us here at Security Token Academy, thanks for listening. Security Token Academy does not provide investment or legal advice. We are not a registered broker dealer or investment advisor. Opinions expressed in this podcast are the speaker's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Security Token Academy. More information can be found on our website at securitytokenacademy.com.